Act One of Saxon and Norman by Amos MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by K. Hand. King Edward the Confessor, read by Beth Thomas. Earl Harold, read by Del de Pignoles. Girth, read by Rachel. Stigand, read by Mike Harris. William the Duke, read by Esteban Simonides. Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, half brother to William, read by Marianne. Robert, read by Sonia. William Rufus, read by Thomas Peter. L'Enfant, read by Apnea. Fitzoburn, read by Larry Wilson. Malay. Read by Thomas Peter. Roger of Montgomery. Read by Newgate Novelist. Hugh Margot. Read by Todd. Saxon Messenger. Read by David Olson. Tai Fei. Read by John Burlinson. Hermit. Read by Joseph Tabler. Queen Edith. Read by Christine G. Gita. Read by Sonia. Edith. Read by Lydia. Matilda, read by Georgia M. Cecilia, read by Rachel. Prologue. Behold, a tale of high and solemn sounding, most fitting that a mighty voice should sing, and we are children only, humbly showing the semblance of so sad and great a thing. Yet see, we pray, through all our simple playing, this theme, majestic of the days of old, a tale of pomp and war and grief o'erwhelming, which in these scenes before you we unfold. Act One, Scene One. Towards the end of the reign of Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor's palace. Entrance on left. A window left. Couch right on which King Edward, who is ill, is seated. Queen Edith left, seated at his feet with a book. Archbishop Steigand right, standing by the king. The hour of Compline is past. Night holds the earth. Go to the bishop. And call to my side Hugh Margot of Fechon. Steigand aside. Margot. Hugh Margot. Outlandish knave. Well, if I must, I must. The king is so wielded by these Norman monks that did they call a black crow white, he would believe their words sooner than his own eyes. Turns left to go. Aloud. I go, my king. Farewell, Stigand. Stigand aside. He loves me not, for I am an honest man and no Norman thief like this fellow. Bumps his shoulder angrily against Hugh Margot, who enters left. Exit Stigand left. Welcome, dear brother Hugh. Hail, great and holy king. Aside, rubbing his shoulder. I do think the barbarian who calls himself archbishop hath broken some of my good Norman bones. Sighs. Ah, me, I must be patient with the froward. Would I could beat thee with thine own unsanctified crozier. Shakes his fist, stands left of the king's couch, takes out parchment. Aloud. My lord king, behold the plan of all that now remains to be built of the new church on Thorny Isle. Shows the plan of the Westminster. That is well, sweet Hugh. Monk moves right to queen. Tis near finished, Edith. This church and monastery I vowed to the beloved St. Peter, and which I have been these thirteen years a-building. Queen looks at plans. It will be fair indeed, my lord. Aside. His talking is ever of building. I think the king loves stones and mortar more than he loves me. Edward takes plans from Monk, who kneels right of the king. It stands on the river, right beyond the west gates of London, and shall be called the Westminster. Tall and white, it will rise above the meadows, and instead of the cry of the bittern across the marshes, will come the holy chant of monks. Monk rises. Saintly king? It will be a church such as no man has seen before in this rude island. <coughs> Verily, Frere Margot, 
Kings shall be buried there. <coughs> Edith, when my Westminster is done and hallowed, I shall be right glad to sleep within its walls, <coughs> for I am weak, <coughs> and very weary of this angry world. In the world only a strong hand may rule, and a heavy hand, my lord, like that of your young kinsman, William of Normandy. Clasps and raises her hands. Alas for England, in which every man strives for dominion. Only he can build thee up, who is strong enough to first lay thee down. Enter left, Earl Harold. Monk draws back, looking at Harold. Here comes Earl Harold. Aside. Stubborn and stiff-necked as his father, swift as he to shed blood. The Earl hates us, gentle Norman monks. I will depart. Moves to go. Edward catches at Monk's sleeve. Nay, brother, abide here, leave me not. Aside to Monk. I do abhor this worldly business which Harold ever brings with him. Good rest to you, my king, and you, my lady and most fair sister. Looks with scorn at Monk. Ah, another monk from Normandy. Monk draws himself up angrily and turns to the king. Edward to Harold. Be patient, Harold. Aside to Monk, looking at Harold. Ah, me, so full of the world and the world's pride, yet withal noble and generous, hardly could I rule without him. Monk shakes his head. Nay, my lord. Hearken to me, I bring good tidings. The Welsh, whom I subdued, are peaceful for a while, and in your northern earldoms of Mercia and Northumbria. Edward interrupts testily. They fight. Harold laughs. <laughs> Nay, for a moment the north is at peace, so I would claim leave to go and hunt it a while, and pass over the sea in my good ships. Edward, anxiously. You will not leave the kingdom, Harold? The king is sick. Go not from him. But for a little space I will be with you ere many days are past. The wind blows from the shore, and I would fain cross the sea and hunt in the woods beyond this isle. In Normandy? With Duke William? Verily. To Flanders or Normandy I care not. If I went to Normandy, Duke William would receive me as a guest. Besides, I fear him not. He is a mighty prince. Harold laughs. I, the tanner's grandson, is become a mighty prince. Yet am I, Earl Godwin's son, Earl of Wessex, conqueror of the Welsh and brother-in-law to the King of the English. Yea, Harold. Raises himself. And when the King of the English is dead... <coughs> You will, perchance, <coughs> if the Witan choose you, wear my crown. Takes the crown in his hands. I have no child. The atheling Edgar is a feeble boy. Though you are not of the house of Kerdick, it might be well if you were king. You have ever acted rightly, Harold, and you will defend England <coughs> in the time to come. To the death, my lord. Queen looks up and takes Harold's hand. To the death, Harold. Yea, verily I would. You must shield the land from her enemies, <coughs> from the savage Welsh <coughs> and the furious Norwegians. Harold interrupts. Yea, and from the wily Normans, I, good shaven head. Looks angrily at Monk. Monk, furious. How dare! Edward lays his hand on Harold's arm. Peace, Harold. Ye are forward to the gentle servants of heaven. Harold draws himself away. Let me go across the seas upon my pleasure. Moves left. I beg you, go not near Normandy, though I love the home of my childhood, and I love my cousin, Duke William. Monk bends and touches King's arm. My lord, the Duke says you did promise he should be king after you. I did so promise. It was long ago. Looks at Crown. Ah, it is a heavy gourd which men desire so fiercely. I dare not choose. <coughs> Heaven will decide who wears the crown <coughs> when I am rid of it. <coughs> it would look well upon your head, brave Harold. Lifts up the crown. Harold stoops down. Think you so, sister. Queen rises, takes crown which she gives to Harold. He sets it on his own head, then gives it to King. Beware of William. <coughs> He is keen and crafty. Go not into Normandy. <coughs> I fear the Duke may do you harm. Never! I fear him not. 
boast not william is subtle and he reckons on our cousinship and ancient amity if you go into normandy harold it will be to the hurt of england <coughs> and to your own dire loss <coughs> and sorrow nay i tell you woe is coming <coughs> go to the casement and look forth all except the king go to the window on left harold draws a curtain and stands left queen centre of window monk right they see a comet and are amazed what is this behold a streaming scar flames through the sky the saints defend us tis like a sword queen hides her face rushes to the king terrace of terrace alas what does it mean herald and the monk come towards king the star foretells <coughs> woe to this land rises and raises his hands if i speak truth may i declare it if falsely may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth full soon shall the fiend stalk through this sinful land harrying it from end to end with fire and sword and the hand of plunder i see tumult and war destruction coming sudden <coughs> as an arrow <coughs> in the night <coughs> closes his eyes and sinks down woe is me i dare not gaze upon it kneels beside the king left tell me whither shall i flee when these sorrows come edward turns to harold when i am gone shelter her and harold have pity on my norman servants points to monk who moves behind couch <coughs> nay i am near death when my westminster is builded let me depart in peace takes harold's hand look to the queen and to england harold and if the witan choose you reign i will my king and would lay down my life ere any stranger should win a rood of english soil but now no talk of dying to-morrow the sun will shine i must away shake not your head dear king i will across the seas <coughs> beware <coughs> i say unto you <coughs> beware farewell exit left he is gone pushes away plans there monk comes to his side left <coughs> take the plans and build fast good hugh <coughs> oh edith i can bear no more i am weary and a heavy sleep falls on my eyelids the queen leads him out left followed by the monk carrying the plans of the abbey scene two edward the confessor's palace next day enter left queen with a book of hours seats herself in a chair right the light of day has come and a fiery star is hid but fear and grief are in my heart i know not why puts down book the sons and daughters of our house were born to greatness tostig was earl of wide northumbria girth and leofwine are brave warriors I am the king's wife, and Harold, most favoured of us all, the darling of the English. Harold, methinks, will be chosen king some day. Enter left, Harold, with Edith Swansneck. He cometh now with the fair Edith. O oh, queen, join your wise counsel to my prayers, that Harold go not over the seas. Earl Harold is wilful after the fashion of our family. I will go. Fear not, my Edith. I fear greatly, lest you fall into Duke William's hand, he knows you are beloved in england once in his power he might not let you go but imprison you for ever william is an honourable prince and would not deal so with one who comes as a friend to hunt and hawk points left see my men wait yonder with my falcons ah pray you be not caught and bound like your own falcon o herald the king has foretold sorrow of this journey no sorrow shall befall me wait but a little there will be glad days for us all I trust you speak truth, my brother. Rises and stands center between Harold right and Edith left. Takes their hands. May blessing light upon you, fair hours and times of peace. Amen, dear lady. Aye, good sister. And now I must to the king. Continually he sleepeth, lying so still and white. Sometimes I think that he will never more open his eyes upon this world. Exit left if holy edward die herald smiles i shall be crowned king i would not wish you greater or more full of care than now you are 
Edith, no care shall ever lie heavy on my heart. I must away. The men have drained their horns of mead. The ships dance on the wave at Barsham. I must away. Alas. Farewell, sweet Edith. Takes her hand. I will return right soon. Exit left. Edith calls after him. Farewell, brave Earl Herald, and remember the king's words. Ah oh, me, my heart is heavy with foreboding of ill. Exit Edith left. End of Act One. Act Two of Saxon and Norman by Amos MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. A few weeks later. Normandy, the Duke's palace, thrones in center, a bench to right of them, a table in right corner on which are a jug and goblet. William Fitzosborne stands right, sharpening arrows and watching Robert and William Rufus at play with a ball in front of the thrones. William Rufus on right. That was my turn. Thou shalt not have the ball. Robert on left. Yeah, but I will, redhead. They struggle. Robert gets the ball. Peace, young wolves. Strikes at them with an arrow. Robert drops ball. William seizes it. I am thy elder brother. Yield it unto me. Stamps. Elder brother. Stamps his foot. Courthouse. Thy short legs could not catch me if I ran away with it. Robert snatches it. Enter left. William and Matilda talking together. They stand center. Children rush on either side. William Rufus left. Shall I not have the ball he gave me? Verily, if thou art strong enough to keep it. Matilda puts hand on Robert's shoulder. Sweet Robert, tis thine. To Rufus. Tis thine elder brother's ball. William takes ball from Robert, who kicks. Gortos must not have all things. Tis his, my lord. Well, do as you will. Go hence and play. Flings ball left. Or fight, for tis ever so, with you. Robert and Rufus run out, struggling to get the ball. Fitzosborne slowly follows them left. Fitzosborne aside. Those boys will work sorrow to us all one day. Exit left. You did smile, my lord. At what good news? Harold is here. I have him. Harold, here. In Normandy. Clasps her hands. His ships are wrecked on the coast, and he taken prisoner by my unruly vassal, Guy of Pontou. I have ransomed him from Guy's del John, and now, full of gratitude to me, his deliverer, he comes to be my guest. Dear my lord, have we not ever longed that Harold should come here? Yea, now he is in my power, my debtor moreover. He will be with us here long. I command that he be brought to me with all honor. William leads Matilda to the thrones and places her beside him. Harold will be amazed at your splendor. You will not let him go without a promise. Takes his hand. Verily, Matilda, and oh, that he will help me to win the crown after Edward's death. The strife that rends England will further our desire. William stretches out his arm. By the strength of my arm will I make it more than a desire, Matilda, and as I hold this unruly duchy will I hold England some day. There will I pluck down the stubborn nobles, as I have put them down in Normandy, and the Earl of Mercia or Northumbria shall no more dare to menace me than Boussac or the Count of Arc here. Hark! The trumpet sounds at the gate, and Harold comes. William and Matilda rise. Enter Harold, escorted by Odo of Bayo and William Fitzosborne, who move right. Harold stands left. Welcome, Earl Harold, to our court of Normandy. Odo, aside to Fitzosborne, looking at Harold. He hath royal bearing. Fitzosborne, aside to Odo. Fair, tall is he and strong. And methinks he might almost bend the duke's great bow. William and Matilda sit down. Harold bows haughtily. I owe you, Duke William, a debt which tis not easy to pay. Aside. Oh, what a trap am I fallen into! The Duke rejoices to ransom so great a guest, Earl Harold. Thanks, gracious lady. I can make but a short stay at your court. Matilda frowning. 
How, my lord? I have spent much time in Guy of Ponthu's hospitable donjon, whence the duke delivered me, and now I must be back in England where I am needed. Matilda motions him to sit beside her on seat right of thrones. Sit here, fair Harold. We in Normandy have desired to see you, for your prowess is noised abroad. Harold sits down by Matilda. We have heard how you defeated the Welsh in their own mountains. I have for a time put down the Welsh, but I must return lest there be other risings. Men say the strength of England lies in Harold. The king, my kinsman, looks to you as a wise and valiant warrior. Before you leave us, Earl Harold, I would crave your help against my rebel Bretons. You shall show us that the Saxon battle-axe is near a match for our Norman sword and mace. That would I do with all my heart. Aside. Would I had never come hither. Enter left, Hugh Margot. Monk bows low to William. Lanfranc of Beck prays leave to speak with you, my lord, on matters of state. Shall he be brought into your presence? Nay, I will go to him. I will see him apart. Rises. Rest here, gentle herald. Come, brother Odo, and you, Fitzosburn, I have work for you to do. Odo aside. A matter of gathering relics and bones of holy men, for a good purpose of the dukes. Exit left William with Odo, Fitzosburne, and Hugh Margot. Think not to leave us. We will have feasts and knightly feats of arms to honour you. Harold aside. How may I escape? Here cometh our daughter. Enter Cecilia, left. Draw nigh, Cecilia. The earl is weary. Fill young goblet with wine for him. Right gladly will I. Fetches goblet, which she fills and hands to Harold, stands on his right. Welcome to Rouen. He smiles and drinks. The wine of Normandy was ne'er more highly favoured. Is it not sweet as a draught of your own island? The sigh for home is drowned in the cup that is given by so fair a hand. Noble Earl, methinks many bright eyes will look forth to your return across the silver sea. I doubt not you are skilful to sing and make sweet music. My song would be a sad one, but you, to Cecilia, could sing merrily, fair child. I will sing gladly to you, Earl Harold, though my voice is better attuned to the music of nuns than to any earthly minstrelsy. Sits beside him, right. Tis better so. The world's music oft leaves the heart uncomforted. Duke William enters silently left while Harold is speaking. Matilda sees him, rises, and meets him in centre. Matilda aside. Harold is moody. Methinks he seeks to go. Go, that he shall not. I'll have him guarded until he has most solemnly sworn to help me to my crown in England. William and Matilda go out left, followed by Harold with Cecilia. Scene 2 Some time later, after Harold has accompanied William on a warlike expedition into Brittany, Normandy, a room in the Duke's palace, a bench on the right, Harold stands center alone. Time creeps on apace since we returned from Brittany, and still I may not go. Oh, I am weary of the feasting within these walls from which there is no escape. For many a day I fought at William's side against the Bretons. I saw how he wages war, exults in the battle, laughs in the face of death. "'Tis a lion that sleeps not night or day, and who knows when he will spring. Turns, faces left. Hark, a step. I am guarded continually. Enter left, William Fitzosborne. Fitzosborne bows. Earl Harold, the Duke craves your presence in the Hall of State, where he hath assembled bishops and nobles of Normandy. Bows, exit left. What does the duke want with me? I am weary of being watched. Enter left, Cecilia. Are you alone? I trust so, maiden, but these dark walls have eyes and ears. You are sad and wrathful. For thee wherefore, Earl Harold? Leads him to bench on right. They sit down. All Normans honour you for your valour against the savage Breton. Do we forget how, with your strong arm, you plucked our men from the quicksand and a grave in the flowing coast knoll? My father says you are a brave ally. Would you be a stern foe, Earl Harold? Verily I should be so, but true to those, Cecilia, 
whose love for me is unfeigned. I fought the Duke's battles, but now I would gladly be at home to defend my own land against rebellions, ay, and against invasions too. Invasions? Know you the fable of the wolf? Nay, you speak in riddles. Hearken, the hour of your departure is nigh. My father has goodly ships to take you, already in the harbour. But before you go he would make one condition with you. Harold stands up sharply. What condition? Nay, that you shall learn from the great duke himself. Harold angrily seizes her hand. You shall tell me what conditions. You will hear full soon. Rises, frees her hand, speaks earnestly. Dear Harold, oh, deny not my father. Most loving is he to those who do his will, but stern beyond measure to them who disobey. Say not nay to aught he ask of you. He has you in his power. El Harold lowers her voice. The dungeons beneath here are deep and terrible. Points to the floor. Without light, without hope. Oh, beware! I hear a sound. I dare not abide longer. Fare you well. Beware! Exit left, swiftly. Harold comes center in front. Of all men am I in most wretched plight. If I should fight my way inch by inch to the gates, I have no ships wherein to cross the sea. You speak truth, Cecilia. I cannot choose what I do. I, once down there beneath these walls and towers of stone, never should I breathe English air, see home or Edith once more. Turns left. So, to the Duke. Exit left. Scene three, the same day. Normandy, the Duke's palace. Thrones in center, on which are seated William and Matilda. To the right are Lanfranc, Malay, Monk, Taliaferr. On the left, Odo, Cecilia, Odo being next to William. In front of the thrones, a shrine covered. Enter Harold, escorted by Fitzosborne, who stands left. I have commanded that ships be prepared to carry you to England, Earl Harold, with rich gifts for yourself and the sick king, my kinsman. Harold, coldly. I thank you for your bounty. All that I did for you in heavy ransom and in costly gifts, I did with a willing heart. For we have rejoiced to see Harold amongst us. Have we not, Brother Odo? Odo laughs. <laughs> yes, Brother Duke. It was verily a joy to see him. <laughs> oh. Laughs. A joy. A most true joy. William, aside. Peace, knave. To Harold. And now before you leave us, do me one favor, one you will not deny me. Before you go back to England, fair Harold, and to Edith of Swan's Neck. Favor? What? What would you have me do? Swear to me, Earl Harold, on this shrine. Points to shrine. Before the bishops and nobles of Normandy, that when my holy kinsman dies, you will help me to win the crown of England which he promised me. What say you? The crown of England? Tis not mine to give. The Witan will choose the king's successor. Nay, Herald, but your voice can lead the council of the Witan. If you speak for me, the crown is mine. Not if the Witan choose me. The king may, moreover, named me his successor. Name you his successor. You are not of the royal house. When saintly Edward dies, he will remember his ancient promise, given before many witnesses, of the crown to me his cousin. And whate'er the Witan urge, you must uphold my right and make me king. You shall wed one of my daughters, and rule o'er half of England. Harold, scornfully. Thank you, my thanks. But— William, bringing down his fist. By the splendor of heaven, I tell you I know not, but— I know that the deed follows my word, as thunder the lightning. Swear to help me win what is my right. Delay not! Pauses, then lifts his voice. Earl Harold, we wait. Yea, we, we wait! wait. Harold puts his hand on his sword. Odo aside. Nay, not even you, with your strong arm, could slay all the Duke's soldiers. Not even Harold could leap the sea. Lanfranc comes forward and addresses Harold. Will you swear to the Duke? Harold aside. What can I do? Slowly advances to shrine. Cecilia steps forward quickly, aside to Harold. 
Oh, say yea quickly, nay is a prison forever. Herald aside. Then may I be forgiven. To Odo, sullenly. What words would you have me say? Lay your hand thus. Place his hand on shrine. And say, I swear, Duke William, tis your sacred oath. Harold repeats after him. In the face of these your bishops and nobles assembled here, to help you to the crown of England when King Edward dies. Harold stands still. Remember you have most solemnly sworn, Earl Harold, before these witnesses. Now, Odo of Bayou, draw the cloth. Odo smiles, steps forward, draws cloth, and shows a shrine containing bones of the saints. Harold starts back. What is this? There are bones here. Aye, bones of the most holy saints of Normandy. And I have sworn upon them. Trembles. Verily, Earl Harold, you have done so. Harold aside. Woe is me! Hides his face in his mantle. Odo aside. See how he trembles, and how his flesh does quiver. Raises his hand. And if you break your oath so given upon the holy bones, the saints will fight against you, and dire and terrible will it be unto you. Herald aside. Alas! So fair a prince would ne'er break face, and now since you will not be entreated to abide longer with us, noble earl, return in peace to England. Rises with Matilda and goes out left, followed by all but Harold. I go to shake the foul dust of Normandy from off my feet. It would take the whole sea to wash me clean. Most wretched of men am I. An oath forced is not a binding oath. Exit left. End of Act Two. Act Three of Saxon and Norman by Amos MacDonnell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Ten Sixty Six, Winter. Normandy, the Duke's Palace, a bench on the right. Duke William, ready for hunting, stands center. Odo of Bayo and William Fitzosborne right and left of him. William gives his bow to Fitzosborne. Take my bow, Fitzosborne. Gladly will I bear it, though you alone, my lord, can bend it, and bend it at full gallop. William to Odo. Will you go hunting with us? I, brother Duke, though a priest, Next to the exchange of thrusts and blows, I love, like you, to chase the tall deer in the forest. I'll go with you. We'll gallop through the thicket and bring down the snow from the branches with the blast of our horns. Fit us burn. We hunt not without you. Turns left. Stay, someone cometh running, as a Saxon bearing. Enter left, Saxon messenger, breathless, raises his hands. Dreadlord, I dare not speak kneels gives thy message speak odo moves left he and fitzosborne stand where they can hear what is said messenger gasps i come from england holy edward is dead harold crowned king he was chosen by the witten and the archbishop put the crown on his head in the westminster the day that king edward was buried there with weeping and lamentations Odo bursts in between duke and messenger. His oath broke. Harold, felon thou wert, and felon ever wilt be. Why did we let thee escape? Messenger jumps up in terror. Slay me not. Tis truth I tell. William to messenger. No more. Get thee hence. Exit messenger left with haste. William stands, angrily fastening and unfastening the clasp of his mantle, then strides to bench sits himself turning towards right and covering his face with his mantle he is choked with wrath like a lion robbed of his prey exit left fitzosborne stands centre watches the duke if i abide here i had best draw nigh him with a big heart if i call not on him to rend harold he will surely up and tear me limb from limb 
approaches the duke hums a tune cheerily more not my duke william looks up therefore say you more not you cannot hide what has happened my lord the news is blazed through every street and ruin ere now edward is dead we cannot mend that and harold has broken his oath is crowned king what say you to that i say my liege we can mend that arise my lord and be doing puts hand on duke's shoulder carry through what you will and take the crown from harold though harold should have all the men of england to fight for him turns round to fitz osborne fitz osborne proudly the normans are a match for the whole flock of english sheep lead us to conquer england by the sword must i win my own crown from the usurper rises and comes centre this for the hour england is divided there be many will murmur to see the son of godwin so exalted the bitter tostig whose earldom harold hath taken away may call in the norwegians against his brother puts hand on fitz osborne's arm faithful fitz osborne bid lund frank come hither for i would speak with him fitz osborne aside his mind was fixed ere i spoke methinks exit left fitz osborne william paces to and fro what e'er be Earl's fortunes would my own barons be true to me would they cross the sea and fight my battles hard shrift have i had since the days when i hid for my life in woods and hovels hard shrift to curb these normans of mine i hold them now but they may rise and fill the land with confusion if i pull the rein tight moreover the king of france is envious he will be ill pleased when the duke of the normans is king of the english we must go cautiously stands right by bench enter left lefranc and fitz osborne my lord what is your pleasure with me sit here points to bench on which they sit down fitz osborne stands left playing with his bow hearken to me and give counsel i counsel you to do your will my lord smiles your questioning is ever a command william laughs ay prior but guess you my bidding this time i think the duke would make himself a king would take his own crown you should rather say the hour is come to do it my lord they say harold was never careful to abstain from perjury and now he is disgraced in all eyes as a breaker of his oath on the relics of the saints men will acknowledge your right i will plead with the pope as i did before in the matter of your marriage yea many a year i struggled for matilda and wedded her in spite of all in spite at first of you good prior but i moved you to help me then now you shall aid me get the crown of england yea the pope will bless this undertaking and not only normans but soldiers from france flemings germans men from north south east west shall flock to your banner chiefly you must look to the normans and if they fight for me shall i forget to reward them england is a fair rich country to give to your normans ours will be a blessed work the ways of the english are rude and wild they eat and drink to excess and the priests are so unlearned that they can scarce read their book when you are king we will show them how normans live our bishops and abbots will restore learning and holy order into the monasteries churches shall rise such as you and matilda have built here you shall leave beck good prior and come to my abbey at cayenne maybe you will rule elsewhere some day for ourselves we shall not have so much business or so many enemies and cares as to forget religion in the fair land of england fair land of england puts down his foot i long to set heel on thee come now my lord call a council of the barons i vow they shall not say you nay i must know how many ships and men my barons can provide re-enter odo with william mallet to odo how many ships could you furnish with the monies i gave unto you odo to win my crown in england odo aside win crowns in england so blows the wind that way aloud i could give you more than a hundred ships brother aside you shall not get one from me unless you promise me some of the fat lands over yonder william signs to odo to sit with him and lanfranc 
fitzosborne and mallet are left in centre mallet coming nearer fitzosborne aside are we bound by our service to follow across the sea this man whose desire is as the hunger of the waves themselves shall the descendants of frollo and the bold norsemen be dragged into all the wars of the tana fitzosborne aside peace if you love your life speak low the hides do sting him to the quick william will tear you if he hears i will keep my limbs then in silence but if i needs must serve him he shall give me somewhat for my pains william eyes them ho oh, knaves what do you in the knot whispering together now by the thunder i think you mean to play me false fitzosborne steps back right nay my liege never we'll help you aside since we may not choose william rises stands centre fitzosborne comes on his right odo stands in front of bench mallet on the left lanfranc stands right with arms folded let the nobles of normandy be summoned and we will learn how many each can provide of men and ships i will give double my due service and raise sixty ships my duke would it were more if need be i will die for you and will give my own heart for yours and i could grasp the world like the rushes on the floor if all were faithful as you fitzosborne all the else beside fitzosborne can build ships and fight my lord truly william mallet i doubt not your love you know england and shall do us good service there messengers will i now send unto harold bidding him resign the crown which he has seized and if he refuse odo pacing to and fro behind the others turns ay if he refuse ho ho if harold refuse then to england ay to england exit william followed by the rest scene two a few months later summer ten sixty six normandy in the duke's palace cecilia seated on a bench right sewing a priest's robe day by day grow the golden stitches the robe is near finished which i will give my mother's church at cain when i am made a nun i shall enter the cloister gladly sings tune evening song song of the british islands first verse repeated after the third verse there is a garden far away with strongest walls set round and roses red and lilies white grow in that guarded ground and there no winter wind doth come nor snow nor hail nor rain and those who dwell there hunger not nor thirst nor weep again a little while and this our toil and journey long shall cease o oh, lead us safe through this dark world and bring our souls to peace now is the whole land full of the sound of war the hammering of the shipbuilders has rung in mine ears all summer and many a waving green tree has fallen to make the ships which my father goeth against herald enter left matilda cecilia rises tis my mother holds out her work behold all i have wrought matilda examines work seats herself on bench cecilia stands behind her left your work speeds fair child i bring good tidings the pope hath sent us a wondrous banner silk it is and wrought with a picture of st peter this hath he given the duke proudly it will wave over the normans leading them to victory are you not glad cecilia i glad and sorrowful too how sorrowful dare ye speak thus nay sweet lady i am glad the holy pope hath blessed our enterprise and sorrowful for herald was a noble knight and true matilda angrily stamps her foot noble true he broke his faith he refuses the demands of the duke and swears he will keep the crown now he has got it silence you anger me no more of harold listen my child takes cecilia's hand draws her down and makes her sit beside her i will tell you something soft in your ear what in secret have i built a ship in which your father shall go to england but he hath all the harbour of the dive full of ships mass like a forest the ship which i have built for the duke is fairer than any one that would make the proud barons of normandy the count of mortran odo himself yea in my own noble kindred sigh for envy 
the sails are of silk, rosy red. Ah, mother. And on the ship is the image of a child of the age and countenance of your brother, William. All gold, Cecilia, with wings wide spread, and in his mouth a trumpet which blows towards England. Well, my father will rejoice and laugh loud when he beholds it. That will he do tomorrow, day by day, unknown to him. I have had built a worthy ship for the greatest of all the Normans. Enter left, Odo, a mace in his hand. Hail, Odo of Bayeux. You look much of a warrior and little of a priest, methinks. We must all turn soldiers when so mighty a business is on hand. See, priest though he be, Odo can strike lustily. Swings his mace and nearly hits Cecilia. Cecilia starts up. Peace, good uncle. Have a care to us. <laughs> we are not Saxons. Laughs. Keep your strength for them. Ye will have need of it across the sea. Yea, tis a perilous venture. We who bide here shall wait for tidings with yearning hearts. Yet we will scarce have time to weep, for while he is away from Normandy, the duke leaves me regent with Robert, my most dear son. Odo walks up and down. The duke did smile and say he had a wife so prudent that he might e'en leave the reins of government in her hands. With our wise counsellors, diligently we will labour to keep peace within his borders until the day when the duke returns victorious. You will conquer. The holy banner from Rome will lead you to victory. Odo stands left facing Matilda. Ha ha. Rubs his hands. Victory. William will be king, Matilda queen, and I. Boast not rashly, nor make vain schemes, but look you, Odo. Stands up between them. And that child, if the duke conquer, then shall the tale of his going and of Harold's coming hither be told. Odo of Bayeux, you shall cause cunning men to draw the story and linen cloth which we women will embroider, and thus tell in stitch work how William conquered, to the people who live when he and I are dust in the churches we have built. Exit with Cecilia, followed by Odo. End of Act Three. Act Four of Saxon and Norman by Amos MacDonnell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, Evening, October Thirteenth, Ten Sixty Six. Harold's camp at Senlac, inside a tent. Entrance on left, bench in the center and on right. In right-hand corner a table with food jug goblet on it enter Queen Edith widow of Edward the confessor who stands in center Gytha who seats herself right Edith swan's neck who kneels at Gytha's feet now is the eve of the battle come William has landed and across the valley points left opposite this hill on which Harold's is encamped are the Norman tents arrayed in the twilight moves to left and looks out Around us are our own campfires, where the men drink and sing the songs of ancient battles. Better were it if they prayed and confessed their sins, as the duke's soldiers do to-night. Seats herself, centre. Maybe you are right. Approaches queen. Dear lady, ah, uh, think you to-morrow will bring us victory or defeat? Who shall say which of the twain will conquer? If Harold, my dearest son, do fall, then ends the glory of the house of Godwin. Edith rises. Surely he must prevail. He beat the Welsh, even now he comes from the red field of the north where Tostig the traitor and the Norwegians lie slain, and where the golden-haired giant Hardrada has won not from Harold but a seven-foot grave. Surely he will defeat the Norman likewise. William is mighty, and tis not the strong arm alone that conquers. Wisdom wins battles. The Duke hath sent messages abroad to the Emperor and to the King of France to draw princes and bishops to his side. The Pope himself hath given him a banner. Harold hath the dragon of Wessex and his old golden standard of the fighting men. I have seen the strong pluck down ere now. Moreover, I have strange misgivings. As Harold prayed before the holy rood at Waltham, 
Thurkill the sacristan will tell you I speak truth. The head upon the cross bowed over him, as it were in grief. Alas for Harold! Will all my sons be slain and leave me comfortless? Heaven grant our bright star be not set. Rises. I must away to Winchester. Farewell, good mother. And you, fair Edith Swansneck, fare you well. Edith comes and kneels. Farewell, dear lady, wise queen. Farewell. From behind my grey walls at Winchester, I'll watch the darkening world. Exit left. Edith kneels with hands clasped. Edith rises quickly. Hark, someone cometh. Is it the king? He was watching his men dig the trenches and make the wooden barricade. Enter left, Garth. Nay, tis Gurth, your younger son. Sits down right by Gytha. Greeting, mother, and you, gentle Edith. Harold is here. Edith rises quickly. Enter left, Harold. Sinks down wearily, center bench. Edith fetches food from right. Let me rest, I am weary. Swift was the march from the north through London here. Scarce time had we to sleep or break bread. Thanks, Edith, this is sweet refreshment. Eats food. I must needs have been in two places at once to prevent William from landing yonder at Pevensey. I trust Edwin and Morker play me not false, and that tomorrow we shall have help from Mercia and Northumbria. Edwin and Morker are envious of the house of Godwin. Alas, the land is divided, earldom against earldom, each man for himself. O oh, Harold, my mind is full of doubt. Fear not, mother. Our spies who beheld the Normans said they looked as if they were priests, not soldiers. Harold laughs. That is because they shave their hair like priests. But I know them, and I tell you that these shaven Normans are terrible in battle. Takes cup from Edith and drinks. Brother, if you esteem the Normans so mighty, fight not against them. They have right on their side. In that you have broken your oath. Harold sets down cup. Not fight? Yea, I and Leofwine and all Wessex, with the earls of Mercia and Northumbria, will fight to the last man to keep out the Norman. But do you, being bound by your oath, forbear— Never! Men shall never say Harold was afraid. I will fight till one or other of us twain is dead. Since we cannot take the Normans by surprise, we must defend ourselves. The hill is well chosen. Unless our wall of shields is broken, we shall prevail as of yore. I have many a tried and faithful soldier. Takes up battle-axe. Woe to the Normans who to-morrow come within the swing of our battle-axe. Enter left Hugh Margot, who holds up his hands. Truce, I come from the Duke. You are safe in the King's presence. Monk, scornfully. King? Give your message. The Duke says, Will you let the Pope judge between you twain? Or will you meet the Duke in sight of all and fight, he and you, and whichever lives shall wear the crown? Tell William the crown is not mine to give. It is true I took the oath, but I took it being compelled. I promised what I could not do. I cannot lay down this crown against the desire of the people who have delivered it unto me. No award of Rome, no combat between me and your lord, could decide the matter, which is between me and the English by whom I was chosen. Go, tell this to Duke William. Tarry not. The Duke— Weary me not. Go, give my message. The Duke bid you consider now, on the eve of battle— whether you will not give up your false claim, and urge the Witan to own him the rightful king. You shall be his greatest earl. Harold springs up. His earl, the Norman's earl, hence with thee, knave. Pushes messenger left. Help, help, I am a monk. I care not who thou art. Gerth comes left, puts himself between Harold and the monk. Harm not a monk, my brother. Harold pushes monk violently. Away with thee. Monk turns. Perjurer! Breaker of both! Harold sends Monk out with a thrust. Out with you! Tell the Norman I'll meet him on the morrow. The battle shall decide betwixt us. They all go out, Harold leading. Scene 2. Morning, Saturday, October 14th, 1066. Duke William's camp. Duke William stands center. Odo of Bayo, Roger of Montgomery, and William Fitzosborne on right. William Mallet with the banner, Talifer on left. The day has dawned, tis St. Colloque's this day. The sun is up, fetches in my armor. Odo rubs his hands. 
Now cometh the battle. I will fight with a club, since a priest may not bear a sword. If there are any faint-hearted here, they will rally quickly when they feel Odo's mace. Ha 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 ha! Laughs. Fitzosborne gets armor, which Taylor holds. Fitzosborne puts on Duke's halberk the wrong way by mistake. All perceive this and raise their hands in dismay. Tis on the wrong way. To Fitzosborne and Talifer. Ye fools! A bad omen for the fight. Alack the day! Alas! Alas! Alas. Now by the splendor of heaven, I will tell you I did never believe in omens, nor ever veiled the eye. Yet if this misputting of my armor signify aught, it may mean that as we do change round this hauberk, changes it round himself. So shall I this day be changed from duke to king. Laughs. I, I, from duke to king, so be it. William to Malay. Bring hither the holy standard. Deliver it to Tostain's Fitzroy the White to carry in the battle. He will bear it gallantly, and with good heart. William Fitzosborne, you and Roger of Montgomery shall lead the men of Boulogne and Poix. Alain Fregant and Amari looks left shall attack the other side with the Poitevans, the Bretons, and the Barons of Maine. And I, with my own great men, my friends and kindred, will fight in the middle throng, where the battle will be the hottest. Raises his sword. If I conquer, you will conquer. If I win lands, you shall have lands. You will not see one coward. None here will fear to die for love of you, if need be. I thank you well. Strike hard at the beginning. Stay not to take spoil. There will be no peace or safety in flight. The sea is behind us. Points right. Sire, we tarry too long. Let us all arm, mount, and go forth to battle. William, to Talifer, who steps forward. What will Talifer, the minstrel? Talifer throws up his sword and catches it. Before the Noman host will I go, and sing loud of Charlemagne, of Roland, and Oliver, and of the peers who died at Roncesvalles. And now a boon, sire, kneels to the duke. I have long served you, and you owe me for all such service. Rises. Today, so please you, you shall repay it. I ask as my guerdon, and beseech you for it earnestly, that I may strike the first blow in the battle. I grant it. Roger of Montgomery comes forward from right. The blows which follow yours, to Talifer, shall be swift and many. Points to the Duke. Never did I see a man so fairly armed, nor one who bore his arms and became his hauberk so well. Let him fight, and he shall overcome. Shame be to him who shall fail him. Never will we. My lord, show your face once in the battle, that we may know you live. I will lift my helm, and should you doubt, I'll cry. Here is Duke William. The boldest of us are pledged that ere this day is done, Harold shall die, and the duke's banner wave from yonder height. Points left. On which the Saxon standard is now planted. Alons, alons. Moves left, leading way with banner. Sound the bugles. Haru! Listens. Hark! Hark the Saxons! Like wild dogs they bark from the hill. We answer. Haru! William raises his sword. Desai! Haru! Haru! Exit left, William holding up his sword, followed by the others waving their swords and shouting, Haru! Haru! Scene 3. During the battle, October 14th, 1066, on a hill near the battlefield. Edith Swan's neck kneels center, watching. Battle is raging out of sight on the left. Enter Steigand from left. Long have I watched the battle. Good bishop, you have fought well, giving and exchanging thrusts and blows. Tis now three hours past noon. The fighting goes up and down, and no man may say who will win. The Normans charge across the valley, but the Saxons stand fast. Hark to Harold's battle cry. Shouts. Harold and the Holy Cross. Harold and Holy Cross. Rises. Pray for the safety of the king. There are fewer to fight now, and the Norman horses trample our men underfoot. If we stand firm to the barricade, 
and suffer them not to draw us forth, we shall do well. The Normans are wily in battle, as in council. Hark! Now our men cry, Out! Out! As the Normans batter on the palisade. Raises his hand. A rood of Waltham, a mighty charge. Stand fast, stand fast. There. We've hurled them back again. Starts. Ah, me! Who has fallen? Edith shades her eyes. The king is there, he stands. See you the light on his armour. Yea, but where is Leofwine? He has fallen. See, he is trodden down. Edith clasps her hands. Alas for Leofwine, the king's brother. I could weep, did I not fear there was more to weep for hereafter. See yonder, the Norman duke himself advances. His men follow him, shouting. He goes through all straight on. Lifts her hands. See how our men fall. Oh, will the Norman reach the king? The men of London stand round Harold to defend him. Yet tis a furious charge. Gurth, too, struck down. Edith lifts her hands. Gurth is slain. Woe is me. I see the sons of the house of Godwin fall like the leaves of autumn before the Norman blast. They come onward as the sea. The nobles of England fall on every side. I will return and fight. Edith catches hold of Steigen's arm. The battle is all confusion now. I cannot see. I will draw nearer. The Norman archers have bent their bows. The arrows fly quicker than the rain before the wind. Go not nigher, Edith. Edith moves swiftly left. Nay, I will know if the king liveth or is dead. Exit left, Steigand, followed by Edith in haste. Scene 4, October 14th, 1066, Night Senlock, on which Harold planted his standard in the morning. Darkened stage. Enter Steigand left, leading Edith Swan's neck. They stand center. The day is done. Yonder. Points left. Into the darkness do the English fly, the Normans still pursuing. Edith clasps her hands. The arrow is in my heart. Harold is slain, that is all I know, and I must find him where he lies on this hill by the hoar apple tree. They did not win the gold standard till Harold, with his brothers, and near all the English nobles, lay slain. Brave was the swing of his uplifted battle-axe, and dead are all the Normans who came within that axe's compass. Bright gleamed his eye. Now darkened for ever. Yea, at twilight flew the arrow which pierced Harold. With his own hand he drew it forth and brake it, and in the pain he bowed upon his shield, and the axe dropped from his hand. Edith hides her face in her hands. Take comfort, Edith. Some live to avenge him. The king is dead. Rings her hands. The king is dead. I will go see what remnant of our host remaineth. Shall I not bring you to Githa? Nay, I will not leave this field until I find the king. I pray that the Norman let you have his body to bury. Even the ruthless Norman would not deny me that. Moreover, Githa will give all she has so she may bury her son in his church at Waltham. Gold, gold. If you can give the tyrant gold, perchance he will suffer you. Farewell. All joy is done. Exit Steigand left. Edith sings. Tune, Farewell Manchester, the National Songbook. Broken shield and axe, silent all the plain. Quick feet trod this morn, herald is slain. Couldst not beat them back, O thou mighty sea? Why blow, false winds, from Normandy? Morning rose to-day, ah, oh, indeed, how bright! Swift as arrow came, ruin and night. Broken shield and axe, all, all was in vain. Senlac, Senlac, O herald is slain! Ah, uh, who will show me where he lies? I call aloud, but the dead sleep soundly on this hill, and only the wind from the sea answereth. Step heard. Yet there is a living step. Who cometh? Enter left a hermit with a torch. A monk. Moves left a step or two. For pity's sake, lend me your torch, friend. My feet stumble in the dark. Follow me. I seek out the wounded and the dead, that I may bury them. Whom seek you? The king. Hermit draws near and looks at her. "'Tis Edith of the Swan's Neck. "'Ah, I will help you to find him who once was king.' "'They move center. "'So many lie here. "'See, a tall form ariseth in the darkness yonder.' "'Looks left. "'Is it his spirit?' "'Hermit draws her back right. "'Nay, tis not Harold. "'Peace, lo, he cometh now who is king.' "'The Norman?' "'Tis he.' "'Enter left, William, followed by Fitzosburn and Mallet. Edith rushes and falls on her knees before William. What will you? 
edith clasps her hands i seek the king that i may lay him in his church at waltham rises githa his mother will give you proud norman heralds wait in gold if we may but bury him there the breaker of his oath deserves no hallowed grave yet when you find him you may carry the usurper to burial so go your way edith to hermit come swiftly hold down the torch i shall know him were he pierced by a hundred arrows exit left edith with the hermit william to mallet go with her mallet see you to herald's burial exit mallet left fitchard's words who buy her him by the sea on the coast which he rashly died defending walks front centre here on this grounds in thanksgiving for the victory will i build the battle abbey where the monks shall ever pray for the souls of those who fell the high altar shall stand there where herald's banner stood and where he was trampled down and died the night deepens let us hence nay i am hungered and i will eat and sleep to-night upon this field not here not here my lord i fear thee dead no more than thee living bid them set up my tent upon this ground walks a few steps left then stands centre fitz osborne on his right then i will consider how am i bind together this broken land exit william left slowly followed by fitz osborne epilogue by the hermit we have set before you our play and shown you the story of that battle whereof the fame is yet mighty you have seen upon our little stage the death of harold and the triumphing of william weep for him who fell whose glory withered away like the flowers of the summer rest and consider the work of him who conquered made peace in the land ruled justly and sternly made england one kingdom who died lonely for no man knew the king's heart think how at length the foes were united the king's wisest son wedded to the saxon the severed branch grafted on to the tree which grew and spread wide its branches lastly remember that in the fullness of time saxons and normans joined to free england great has been the work they wrought together for us eternal as the spring which year by year clothes with fresh grass and blossoms the field where their fathers died fighting against one another end of act four end of saxon and norman by amos macdonald